This is Dr. Levin coming to you for the VIP team, the first global university where the student gets paid to study. And I do hope that you have enjoyed chapter one and two of the science of getting rich. Uh, today we're going to address chapter three. If for any reason you had not seen uh, the first chapters, uh, go ahead to the YouTube channel and check the introduction and chapter one, one video, second video, the uh, science of getting rich chapter two or class two. Today is class number three. And I want to inject something quickly before we get started in that this book is written in 1910. Naturally, some of the examples that he gives here in chapter three are dated of the time of the writing of the book. However, the principles hold as true today as they did back then. As a matter of fact, if you, when he's referring to some of the newer uh, industries like the uh, air transportation industry, well, think of the internet today or think of how we're revolutionizing education thanks to the VIP team and our unique approach. So off we go with uh, chapter uh, three. The title of the chapter is, Is Opportunity Monopolized? No man is kept poor because opportunity has been taken away from him, because other people have monopolized the wealth or have put a fence around it. You may be shut off from engaging in business in certain lines, but there is other channels that are open to you. Probably it would be hard for you to get control of any of the great railroad systems. That field is pretty well monopolized, but the electric railway business is still in its infancy and offers plenty of scope for enterprise. And it will be but a very few years until traffic and transportation through the air will become a great industry and in all of its branches will give employment to hundreds of thousands, perhaps to millions of people. I want to interject here for a moment, side note, uh, look at airline, uh, at the airline industry, how correct he was in foreseeing that that would be one of the next great industries, as we can foresee right now that the internet obviously is the next great industry. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, just uh, yesterday, I found out that there is 70,000 flights per day. And you probably know that there is no airport in the world where they're not doing expansion. So uh, he's been spot on. Uh, again, this is 1910 that he foresaw that air transportation would be a good uh, industry to get into. So he says, why not turn your attention to the development of aerial transportation instead of competing with J.J. Hill and others for a chance in the steam railway world? Again, the book written 1910. It is quite true that if you are a workman in the employ of the steel trust, that you have very little chance of becoming the owner of the plant in which you work. But it's also true that if you will commence to act in a certain way, you can soon leave the employ of the steel trust. You can buy a farm from 10 to 40 acres and engage in business as a producer of foodstuffs. There is a great opportunity at this time for men who will live upon small tracts of land and cultivate the same intensively. Such men will certainly get rich. You may say that it is impossible for you to get land, but I'm going to prove that it is not impossible and that you can certainly get a farm if you will go to work in a certain way. At different periods in the tide of opportunity sets in different directions according to the needs of the whole and the particular stage of social evolution which has been reached. At present, 1910, in America it is setting towards agriculture and the allied industries and professions 
Today opportunity is open for the factory worker in his line. It is open for the businessman who supplies the farmer more than for the one who supplies the factory worker. And for the professional man who waits upon the farmer more than the one who serves the working class. There is an abundance of opportunity for the man who will go with the tide instead of trying to swim against it. So the factory workers, either as individuals or as a class, are not de deprived of opportunity. The workers are not being kept down by their masters. They're not being ground by the trusts and combinations of capital. As a class, they are where they are because they do not do things in a certain way. If the workers of America chose to do so, they would follow the examples, as for instance, of their brothers in Belgium and other countries and establish great department stores and cooperative industries. They could elect men of their own class to office and pass laws favoring the development of such cooperative industries. And in a few years, they could take peaceable possession of the industrial field. The working class may become the master class whenever they will begin to do things in a certain way. The law of wealth is the same for them as it is for all others. This they must learn and they will remain where they are as long as they continue to do as they do. The individual worker, however, is not held down by the ignorance of the mental slothfulness of his class. He can individually follow the tide of opportunity to riches, and this book will tell him how. No one is kept in poverty by the shortness in the supply of rich, richness, riches. There is more than enough for all. A palace as large as the capital at Washington might be built for every family on earth from the building material in the United States alone. And under intensive cultivation, this country would produce wool, cotton, linen, and silk enough to clothe each person in the world finer than Solomon was arrayed in all his glory, together with food enough to feed them all luxuriously. So the visible supply is practically inexhaustible. And the invisible supply is really inexhaustible. Everything you see on earth is made from one original substance out of which all things proceed. New forms are constantly being made and older ones are dissolving, but all are shapes assumed by one thing. And there is no limit to the supply of formless stuff, of original substance. The universe is made out of it. It was not all used in the making of the universe. The spaces in and through and between the forms of the visible universe are permeated and filled with the original substance, the formless stuff, the raw material of all things. 10,000 times as much has been made might still be made, and even then we should not have exhausted the supply of universal raw material. No man therefore is poor because nature is poor, or because there is not enough to go around. Nature is inexhaustible, an inexhaustible storehouse of riches, the supply will never run short. Original substance is alive with creative energy and is constantly producing more forms. When the supply of building material is exhausted, more will be supplied. When the soil is exhausted so that foodstuffs and materials for clothing will no longer grow upon it, it will be renewed and more soil will be made. When all the gold and silver has been dug from the earth, if man still is in such a stage of social development that 
there is need for gold and silver, more will be produced from the formless. The formless stuff responds to the needs of man. It will not let him be without any good thing. This is true of man collectively. The race as a whole is always abundantly rich. And if individuals are poor, it is because they do not follow the certain way of doing things, which makes the individual man rich. The formless stuff is intelligent. It is the stuff which thinks. It is alive. It is always impelled toward more life. It is the natural and inherent impulse of life to seek, to live more. It is the nature of intelligence to enlarge itself and of consciousness to seek to extend its boundaries and find fuller expression. The universe of forms has been made by formless living substance, throwing itself into form in another in order to express itself more fully. The universe is a great living presence, always moving inherently towards more life and fuller functioning. Nature is formed for the advancement of life. Its impelling motive is to increase life. For this cause, everything which can possibly minister to life is bountifully provided. There can be no lack unless God is to contradict himself and nullify his own words. You are not kept poor by the lack in the supply of riches. It is a fact which I shall demonstrate a little further and that even the resources of formless supply are at the command of the man or woman who will act and think in a certain way. And that completes chapter 3. Chapter 4 is going to be the first principle in the science of getting rich. The science of getting rich written by Wallace Waddle way back in 1910. And I hope today you have seen how uh, powerfully his uh, truths and principles hold today. Um, I would urge you, since we are the first university where the student gets paid, if you're wondering how could I be paid, where is the money coming from, go ahead, look for that video on our YouTube channel, subscribe to the YouTube channel, do join us on Skype and on Facebook. If you haven't signed up for a free account with the VIP team yet, go ahead and do so. That way you can explore everything from the inside and um, uh, come to, to the Skype group or Facebook group to ask us questions so that we can give you uh, insight on how everything works. I thank you for permitting me to share chapter 3 of The Science of Getting Rich on your way to become wealthy and healthy. Thank you.